It's time to take command with former NFL tight end Logan Paulson and former Commander's Beat reporter Craig Hoffman. Welcome into Take Command. I'm Craig Hoffman. He is Logan Paulson. It is Tape Breakdown Day, Logan, the pod that everyone has been waiting for. Everyone's been waiting for it? That's exciting. Yeah. I didn't realize it was such a big deal. It's you breaking down Uh, tape. Of course everyone's waiting for it. That's right. That's right. Uh, That's right. Do that over the next 45 minutes. Get into all the X's, all the O's, starting with uh, Sam Howe and the offense slogan. A obviously prolific day, 299 yards passing for Howe. Uh, the running game gets going in the second half as well, but uh, there's plenty to critique. It's, it's kind of, in many ways, the perfect game that coaches always talk about. Like, we want to yeah. win the game, but we want to have stuff to work on uh and and feel the pressure to know that like hey if we don't clean this up we might not win the next one so if you're if you're getting into what you saw from the offense thirty thousand foot view before we dive into sam specifically and some of these protections and some of the plays themselves like what do you what did you take away from watching the tape yeah thirty thousand foot view i think the again with stuff we talked about on the on the pod right after the game like it's just how resilient the team was and the character of the team and their ability to kind of switch the tide there you know 21 to 3 is a tough look you get that fumble by Jamin then you get a drive that's not the most pretty drive in the world it's a little bit of a slog fest screen to Cole Turner ends up being almost a first down they get the first down on a run by B Rob and they run that uh, jet sweep to Curtis you know like that again it's like a little bit of kind of we're getting into the deep bag of trips then on fourth down they get that amazing play to Logan Thomas when that hit and you're just like wow that like that that the turnover to that awesome character by the team, right? Then you come back out, the defense goes three and out, then you get a drive, and one of the best throws I've seen in a long time from anyone within this organization, that throw to Bates on that cover two shot, like, oh my gosh, on a third and 13 to kick a field goal, and all of a sudden it's 14 to 21 coming out of half, you get a stop by Deron Payne, three and out. I mean, I say Deron Payne, it's the defense, but Deron no, Payne. You got to stop by Deron Payne. We, we were joking is- yesterday on the show, Michael Phillips was on with us, and, and literally, I was like, Michael, you and I could have played safety for Cam Curl and Derek Forrest, <laughs> and that, that series would not have been any different. Right. And so, and so then, a great, great job by him. And again, you just like big moments with big players stepping up in those moments. And then that next offensive drive is the Terry touchdown. And you're just like, Holy cow. Like it literally it was, there was no time in between. It was like, we got the fumble by Jamin that drive. We score two minute drive. Like it was like they had 55 seconds or something like that. They get points three and out points. And it's just like that, that is something I, I can't articulate how hard that is to do offensively, given the environment, given the conditions, given how that defense and the offense was playing in the first half. And then for them just to say like, no, we're not going to do this anymore. Like, like when I was in Atlanta, man, we were a pretty good football team, but there was a lot of times where we would just get kind of get taken behind the woodshed early. And it's so hard to overcome those moments. It's so challenging. Guys would make plays, something would happen, and then you'd sidetrack yourself. You know, and I look at the two minute drive, there's a holding call, right? That gets them to third and it's, it's, it's first and 20, right? They get like a completion of Terry. It's second and a, or second and 11 or second and something. Second and 15, they got a little run, little little dump off to Curtis. And then it's third and 13, they get that, like, to, to just handle those moments and overcome the adversity of those moments. I just, like, it was, it was incredible. You know, it was, like, literally incredible to watch that. And it's just something that, like, we talked about in the post game. Like, we haven't, I haven't seen it here for a long time. In my 10 years of playing, I didn't see it very often. And when you watch week to week, you don't see it very often. So, um, just kudos, like that's my thousand foot view. Like that is a different type of character for this team. And it's something that as a fan, as a coach, as a member of the organization, you can build off of and say like, we are different than we've been in the past. And hopefully that continues is, is my 30,000 foot view. Yeah. I think the other thing that almost is forgotten in this game is how it could have turned back and Washington held on. Obviously you get the yeah. Hail Mary at the end, but there's, there's the, um, Started second half in three and out Deron Payne series, right? Touchdown, sweet. Interception uh, by Emmanuel Forbes. They're rolling. Yeah. Well, then they are in great field position, and then Sam takes a bad sack and screws it up. Ron decides to kick the 59-yard right. field goal, which is a terrible decision um, based off the game flow. Just, I mean, it's not indefensible in that you're at altitude and Joey Sly's leg is the size of a house. Right. But 
it is, I don't think it was the correct move. It, I thought it at the time. I, I have obviously seen the result. No different feelings now. Sure. Um, and so Denver gets a field goal. The response from Washington is touchdown, three and out, touchdown. Yeah. And then they make Denver take 15 plays when they're down double digits to get a field goal. Yeah. Like that is how you respond. And had you not had a Hail Mary at the end, like it is a clean, easy win from there when it very much could have uh, switched, you know, in terms of the the momentum on that missed field goal. Missed field goals are the kinds of momentum swinging plays that you see all the time in the NFL. Instead, Washington comes right back down, marches it into the end zone. All right. We get into Sam Howell's uh, day. How do you yeah. how do you look at what he did and and the good, the bad, if there was any ugly, the ugly? I mean, like you know, like with anything, there's a there's some good, some bad, and there's it's a, it's a it's a scale of gray, right? Yeah, there's nothing ne never everything that's uh, you know extremely good. So like, let's talk about. I think there's a lot of fans that are like, oh, the offensive line's terrible. They can't protect Sam. Sam, you know, is drawing some of that. You know, like he 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 invites pressure in certain situations now. Like the one that Leno gets beat clean, that's on Leno, right? Like that's, you know, Leno yeah. doesn't hear the snap count. He's setting the four eye, like he's setting for a game. I understand what he's looking at, but like sometimes like that happens, like guys make mistakes, um, you know, but on the whole, I would say that there are times where Sam is holding the football way too long. He's inviting pressure. Now I will say some within those repetitions, there's opportunities where I think the receivers could be a little bit more urgent in terms of winning, right? There's one where Jahan's running a choice route. He kind of skip releases. He's really taking his time. Like, just accelerate that process a little bit. You know what I mean? Like, make it super clean for Sam that he can say no right away. There's another one where they're running, like, two sit routes to the offensive left, and Jahan, or I think it's, it might be Diami, is running a high cross. It's in the first quarter coming across the formation, and Jahan does a really good job of pushing it vertical and then breaking it flat so it holds the coverage but he's not getting to the space in the timing. So I'm kind of like, if you were to just hurry that process up, is it just more clear for Sam? And that's one of the things with a new offense. Like, obviously, there are times where Sam is, you know, he's rolling into pressure. He's doing stuff that he shouldn't do. He should be stepping up in the pocket and delivering the football. But there's also times where I'm like, the timing of this just seems a, a tick off. He's got to wait for this longer than he should. And so I think it's a combination of things, right? There's certain times where the offensive line loses. But on the whole, man, you know, like this was a tougher outing for them than the first week, and we expect it to be so. But on the whole, that I got a lot of respect for that group. And what I mean by that is like they freaking fight. They are but they're not maybe the most talented guys of all time, but there's never a down where I'm like, <clears throat> oh, this guy's not trying. This guy's not giving his best effort. And there's been no lines where I've been watching in the past where I'm like that the strain and the struggle to pass protect and run block isn't there. Like there was a play where uh, they run an ET and it's Wiley and Cosme, right? And Cosme is a little bit late passing off to Wiley and the, the end comes around. It looks like he's going to be free of the quarterback. Cosme is diving full parallel to the ground, diving to get hands on that spinner, pushes him past the quarterback and Sam's able to scramble for 10 yards. And you're just like, those are dudes that football is important to. They're fighting their tails off. You know, Cosme and, uh, and Sadiq are on – Brian Robinson's screen, they're like literally 35 yards down the football field blocking people. Like, by the way, on that one, B Rob, slow down a second, bro. Yeah, just let your boys, like, let, let your, let, let your guys, <laughs> they ran all that way. And if you, you let them hit someone, you probably score. Right. I know and, you're scared of getting caught from behind, but buddy, you're, you're, you're right there. Yeah. 35 well, yard gain could have been whatever was left to the end zone. And we'll talk about those screens more in a minute, obviously, in more detail, but. That, that's how I feel about the O line. Like they're gonna, there's gonna be times like where like the Leno thing, you get beat by Nick Benito, right? You get sure. beat, and that's gonna happen. You know, even week one, you get beat by um, you know Gardak on the spin move if you're Wiley. Like those things are gonna happen. But what I am really excited to see is that they're not happening at the rate that I thought they were gonna happen. And I think they, it, this is a tenable offensive solution. Like I just finished watching. Um, I'm starting to do some uh, some Buffalo prep, and you think our O line's bad. Like their right tackle at times is just basically letting dudes run straight to the quarterback, and like that's the, I, I, and that's that's not an indictment of him as a player, Brown, because I think he's a pretty good football player. But it's hard to pass protect, especially if you're the right tackle in the NFL, because you're a little bit less athletic. All those things. I think this group is working well together, and I do think some of this stuff Sam is bringing on. So in terms of negatives with Sam, because I know that's where this conversation started, that's yeah. the one negative. 
He's holding the ball a little bit too long. And I, could that be helped by the concept? Yes. Could that be helped by the receiver? Yes. But despite that, you see enough of the really high-end, uber-talented stuff to make you say, man, like if he can get that ball out a little bit earlier, more consistently, this is going to be awesome for this organization. So I will obviously get to the good with Sam in a second, but I want to circle back to the receiver point because I think this is interesting and is a part of a larger NFL discussion that is kind of starting to happen with some pretty hideous football through two weeks across the league. This is where preseason matters it's because true. in training camp, even in a joint practice, that little bit late doesn't matter because the timing of that is that your quarterback still gets to make the throw even if Jahan is skipping his way down the field or Diami's a little bit late to that or Terry's a little bit late to that because he can't get hit. But in preseason, if Sam takes a shot and is like, oh, I guess I got to get that ball out a little faster. And he goes back to the sideline. And he's like, yo, Jahan, like I need you there a half second earlier. Can you please speed up your process? And Jahan sees that on film and you get to coach that on film. That that matters. Yeah. And I think that what you're seeing across the NFL is a bunch of offenses that are out of sync when the reality that the quarterback can get smashed in the face comes to fruition. Sure. And I think that this is something that coaches are going to have to look back on. I, I have to go back and do a much more extensive study, and I'm sure some NFL national writer will do this for me. Uh, I don't know who, but someone, someone will go back and look at who played what during the preseason and how those teams have started. Yeah. But I know for Washington's sake, like they look a lot sharper, even with the stuff that we're talking about. They look a lot sharper than a lot of teams that a lot of people thought were going to be better than them. And yeah. they played their guys a lot more in the preseason than a lot of other of those teams. Joe Burrow doesn't play in the preseason at all. Cincinnati looks like a mess through two yeah. weeks. And obviously he's now hurt again, but that's a different story. And his was injury related. But like they weren't going to play him in the preseason well, anyway. I mean, I think there's a precedent. Like every team that I've been a part of and, and you know, every during my time in the league, Every team that played the starters was a problem week one, week two, week three, week four, week four, week five. Like early in the season, they were a problem because they were ready to go. The, I think the the debate comes like into full circle where it's like, where is the health of this team or the teams that play a lot of their starters later in the year? In conjunction, right. you know, everyone talks about that immediate like, oh, Terry hurt his toe. Like obviously that's that's an issue, you know, because you don't want that to happen. But there's also the the accumulation of repetitions over the course of preseason regular season and especially with an 18 game season so i do think that's also part of it but to me yes. there's there's no question teams that play a lot in the preseason play better week one like and there's I no don't, question. like i think the happy medium though is like just play a little in the preseason yeah. right like play at most your starters a half because those extra like i remember when we were in baltimore and i asked kendall at the presser like you know, hey, what what does it mean for you not playing the, that first preseason game? And he goes, bro, five reps is not going to be the difference in me, sure. you know, having a good season and not. And like five reps, maybe it, it does matter a little bit more to an offensive player trying to get in that timing or whatever uh, on that side. But, but the point is like five, 10, 15, 20 reps of game action. I don't think it's going to have much of a cumulative effect on later in the season. I think I think the like there's a much bigger impact on and this might be counter to like people could probably pull clips of me in the preseason saying something opposite and I'm owning it right now. But like, I think that the, the learning opportunities and the timing and the crispness of it all are worth it. And there's not much of a physical cumulative effect from playing that number of reps that later in the season, it's going to matter. I do think there is the obvious of the immediate injury concern where, yeah, yeah. later in the season, if a dude tore his knee up, um, you know, yeah, that's that's going to matter, and that's not going to happen if he's not out there. But it is very, very clear that some of these offenses, and you know, I think that's a great example of what you're talking about, where preseason versus uh, joint practice versus practice, there is a big difference, yeah. and the receivers understanding where they need to be on time because now their quarterback can get hit for real is one of those areas where it matters the most. No, I mean, I totally agree, and I think um... – you know, like again, I, I and I think on the whole, this offense has been relatively relatively sharp. But there are details. Yeah. You know, and there's a difference. Again, there's a difference between preseason and regular season in terms of speed and uptick. And you know, some of the concepts we're talking about are are relatively new. To, like obviously, the choice by Jahan is not new, but I do think like again, like there's you know, coaching at the high school has really shown me a lot about this process. And it's and it's it's different because you don't have as much time. But it's there is a a learning and an understanding that happens in the regular season that 
as a player looking back, I'm like, oh yeah, that happened every time we played. It's like you're still finding what you're good at. You're still finding the runs you're good at. You're still finding the pass protections you're good at. You're still, you're still finding the route concepts that you're good at. And so, like, detailing that stuff up in practice is one thing, especially with a new offense, but detailing up in the game, that's where you're like, oh, shoot. Like, this is the first time Jahan's run a choice. This needs to be a little bit faster. Oh, this is the first time we've run this high cross. We need to be more deliberate about our angle, our departure angle to get across. And so those details, while I do think this team is pretty sharp and I do think their offseason was excellent, like, those – Finer details don't come to light until, like you're talking about, Craig, until they've got that live rush. And they're like, oh, the timing doesn't work because the rush is better here. Or the, the timing doesn't work because the, the safety is a little bit faster or whatever it is. You know what I'm saying? So right. I think all that stuff is going to – you're going to see some of that detail, like those really fine details over the next couple of weeks until probably week five or six where it's like this is who we're really good at. And then they'll have another you know, kind of evolution and maturation of the offense – going into probably week 10 and 12, you know, like it's, it's crazy how there are these kind of cyclical moments in the NFL where it's like, Oh, we're, we're at, this is what we're good at. Oh, nope. We need to evolve again. Oh, nope. Here we go again. And yeah. so it's, it, these are their games, but they're also learning opportunities to say, Oh man, we really don't like this matchup versus this coverage or whatever. And so I think some of the details that we're talking about here from a receiver standpoint, will get cleared, cleaned up as we go. And I think it's great that they're able to your point, Craig, clean that stuff up in a, you know, in a win, right? Like it's nice right. for me to be able to make those corrections and be like, this wasn't what we exactly wanted, but it's, e it's, it's much more palatable as a player to be like, okay, yeah, I got that for next time. And that makes a lot of sense as opposed to like, Hey, you know, Logan, we need this done. If we make this play, we win this game. And you're like, Oh gosh, this is terrible. Like, and then right. that stress isn't quite there the same way. So. Which, uh, as my pal, Don Van Nata from ESPN observed uh, last night, watching the terrible Monday night football, he's like, I remember I, he goes, I'm old enough to remember a time where people did this stuff in games that didn't matter in the regular season standings. Uh, but if you're going to have to do it during the regular season, much better to do it in a win than a loss. Okay. So that gets to, uh, back uh, to Sam. And, uh, now's the part where we, we praise him. Uh, now's the part where we go, Hey dude, you got a chance to be real good in this yeah. league. Because some of the stuff he does, the third and 13th throw to Bates, insane. I mean, the only throw that I can think of in the last five years in this organization that's that good is the Carson Wentz week two Lions last year where he rolls left and then throws back, I think it was to Curtis, up the right sideline. And you're like, yeah, oh, I see the why they traded that? for him. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, that was like literally the one. One, um, yeah. one, one of one. Uh, but, you know. That Sam makes four throws in this game that are that good. The throw to Terry is is nuts. Unbelievable. You know, on yeah. the on the touchdown, um, the throw to Logan is Crazy. is ridiculous. Um, and I think what's great about some of those too is you see the timing. You see when he's decisive. You see when he gets yeah. the ball out. When his feet are set. When, you know they're underneath him. That this offense looks chef's kiss good yeah. uh, when when he's on time and on target. Yeah, I mean it's just like. It's the it's the physical talent, quite frankly. It's the physical talent combined with the confidence. I would say, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, him for, for the like because <clears throat> when you look at, at the all twenty two, the throw to Terry is like not really there. You know, you get Simmons like dropping under this thing and kind of like this weird Tampa two coverage with the safety. The corners like right on Terry's back. Like the margin for error on that throw is basically like a foot, and for him to just dice that in there to Terry and Terry makes an excellent catch. Obviously, it makes him right. But, like, there's confidence. There's a belief in your player. There's the physical talent to get that done. And I get, and I honestly, like, there just hasn't been a guy here who's been that talented, like, physically gifted to do that. So, like, when you – and the throw to Bates, man, holy cow. That was – That's nuts. Real. In stride, over the corner, before the safety. Great job by him. The, the laser beam he throws to Logan in a tight window – um, I think he's a little late on that throw, which is why the safety is able to get over there. But again, even though he's late, he can put such velocity on the ball. Like it's crazy. So there are those moments and it's just like, can this young player develop the timing element of this offense to a point where we're talking about him in the same conversation as like a top 10 player? You know, like that's, that's what we're talking about here. Cause he's shown the physical ability to do some stuff where you're like, wow, you know, like, I listened to a lot of talk radio. They did a lot of analysis of this game because it was kind of the fun game in that time slot. And one of the things that people kept saying is like, 
you know, if he can figure out this sack thing, and I totally, I think we're totally in agreement with it. The sack, the pre- it's not the sack thing, the pressure thing, and inviting mm-hmm. pressure. If he can get better at that, like he's got it. He's got that it factor. But like I've seen a lot of guys with the it factor who can't figure out that sack thing, who or the pressure thing. It's not a sack thing, the pressure thing. Um, and, and don't become good players. You know what I mean? Because it's just the offenses can't function the way you need them to function when they're taking so when they're inviting so much pressure, when they're taking so many sacks. So um, and again, that's not all on him, like we just talked about. There's some O-line elements, there's the receiver, there's the skill elements, but man, like, and I don't want to be overhyped, but Gosh, like that, the ability to make some of those plays, I think back to Arizona, the ability to make that throw to B-Rob for the touchdown, the scramble for the touchdown, like that is what we're talking, that, that is the standard for the position. So uh, I'm very excited for um, for him and his ability. And, you know, like there's there's good and there's bad, but like, and it's all, all in a scale of gray, but it, it's as, as, a, as a fan of football and a fan of this team, like it, it's, it's, it's an exciting proposition to have a guy like this in the building. No doubt. And I think some of the things I like about where Sam is and the potential to come that franchise guy, maybe even a top 10 quarterback in the NFL is some of the stuff you're talking about will come with experience. The more you see and the more chances you get to play, uh, which by the way, involves cleaning some of this up sooner rather than later, because the the chances to play go away if you take a bunch of hits and you get hurt. So, you know, that these are on some level self-fulfilling prophecies, but, um, you know, he's going to get a bigger file week by week by week. His file yeah. now on, on regular season games is twice as big as it was last week. Um, and he'll have another one this week and it'll keep growing the more he sees. And that's great. But then you talk about kind of the the environment that he's in. Great skill positions. And please let him be with Eric Bieniemy for a couple of years. Yeah. Here. Like Bieniemy will obviously help him tremendously but he will also help these other guys get better and demand a level of precision and excellence in this offense that can clean up the, the speed of the receivers getting to the route that will help the offensive line do what they need to do. Like I, I think coaching matters immensely in this league for players like Sam Howell. Like Peyton Manning would have been good wherever. There's, there's a certain tier of players that will be good wherever they go. That player is extraordinarily rare and even rarer at the quarterback position. But for someone like Hal with his talent, you get with the right coach and are able to be with him in the right part of your career and you can develop into something pretty special. Well, I was going to say, even even with people who are uber talented, like look at Trevor Lawrence and his his stint with Urban Meyer. Like he's maybe the most talented guy since Andrew Luck, you know, and he had a really hard time because the coaching wasn't there to support him. So now you get Sam, very talented, has a coach to support him. Um, you know, and I think like, yeah, man, it's just... It, it, there is a lot there. And, you know, I think I don't want to, like we said, he could, we, I just want to make it clear. Like you said, he top 10 guy. We think he has that physical ability, but he, it's going to take time for him to get there. He's got to learn. He's got to improve. The other thing I want to just point out is the EB thing, man. Like EB is also in this, in this time period, learning what he can and can't do. And maybe as the game, as the, as the weeks go on, he can find more concepts that speak to scan, Sam's skill set in a way that I'm, or speaks to some of the deficiencies we're talking about in terms of getting the ball out of his hand quicker. So again, that's something that I'm I'm kind of excited to see too. Like, how does EB elevate him? I think EB's done a great job with this offense, installing it, coaching it, detailing it. But now, how do you start to shape it? Now that you've got these two games of data, shaping it to the signal caller and elevating him, because I do think like in the second half of this game, I think the offense looks completely different, and in large part because you're hitting some different concepts. You, you you've kind of backed off the RPO a little bit. You're running more screens like and again that doesn't seem like a big deal but you're taking some of those decisions off of him and you're making plays that he, you're making excellent plays in the context of the offense with him getting the ball out of his hands quickly and maybe you see more of that as you as the season more uh or more of that earlier in the game as the season moves on yeah i think there's one rpo in this game that like i think it was to gibson and gibson would have had his head on the goal post and sam kept it and you're just like dude I can't remember where where it was yeah, in the game, that. but I just remember that you said RPO and that that flashback. I think I'm remembering uh, correctly on that one, but whatever. Uh, on the EB front, um, super super pass heavy early in this game, and one theory yeah. that I've been kicking around, and um, I'm I might try to even get out to Ashburn Thursday to be enemy's press conference and ask him this. I don't know if he'll answer it directly, um, but we'll find out uh, if I go is. Is he passing so much early in the game in part in data collection, right? Like the first 15 is 
often designed in a way to use a bunch of different personnel and formations and three by ones here, two by twos there. Let's split the back out. Let's do this with a tight end to get information. And then let's run these concepts to see what coverages we get against them. And then we know what they're doing. And later in the game, we can come back to it. And it almost feels like the skews are so dramatic in these first two games past to run early that I kind of wonder if he's overloading some of that information early in the game to get tells from the defense or schematic, you know, information from the defense. Then it's like, okay, let's settle in. Let's start to run the ball a little bit. Let's get him guessing. And then we know we can come back to this thing later. We know exactly what they're doing, where the ball needs to go, and we we start to get some explosive plays. Any that's that's a theory I've been kicking around. Any potential credence to that, considering they dropped back thirty three times in the first half and only ran the ball seven times. Yeah. <clears throat> so a couple of things. Um, I don't know about all that. I think one of the things that sticks out to me is like they do early in the game. They had a lot of runs called that ended up being thrown. So I want to say there's probably, I don't know, seven, okay. I don't know, five to eight runs there maybe, you know. So five right? to eight RPOs that wind up yeah, being the P, not the R. That he that he threw. And that's pro- probably five. Let's say five. And I, I think that's, that's part of it. And, and again, you don't call runs as a coordinator or a play caller when they're not going well. And, and there wasn't a lot of sled in there in terms of like, you know, being super effective. And I would say like looking at it, uh, one of the things that stuck out to me is, again, when you're throwing those RPOs versus the tight coverages you were getting, they're very rarely going to be good because it, you're always going to have guys matching that ball really quick. They're matching the screen really quick. So uh, one of the things, and I don't know if this was an adjustment that they made, is I felt like they were just like, we're running the run. When we call the run, hand it off. And I felt like you got a more confident execution from the running back. You got a more confident execution from the offensive line. And some of the holes that were there early that, you know, you're not getting to because you're throwing the football are more available now in the second half. So that's one thing I think is maybe just if you want to call a run, just call it. It doesn't need to be an RPO. You know, like you can run that action over there, but tell Sam, hey, make sure you hand this off unless it's a crazy look, you know, because there's a couple times where he's pulling it, you know, and it's a bad look. He's throwing the ball out to tackle for a one yard gain. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it's not super efficient. So that was one thing that, that kind of stuck out to me in terms of game flow is like, I felt like in the second half, they were like, no dude, just hand the ball off. And then I, you know, they ran some stuff from the, uh, from the dot, which was great to see. They did some stuff in the first half with that too, but it was much more effect- effective in the second half. And I just was like, maybe, maybe that's something they could do to kind of help that skew. Cause I think, you know, what'd you say? They had nine, nine runs in the first half. Is that right? Seven. It was seven. 33 dropbacks to seven called runs that were run. So yeah. obviously, you know, there's some scrambles and but, stuff from Sam, but the attempts were a little bit skewed, but that was, it was 33 dropbacks uh, was the, was ultimately the total. Yeah. But if you take, runs. if you take away five of those and you're at 20, right. 28 and you're at, 12 runs that feels a little bit different especially given the game flow with with like kind of two two minute drives you know what i mean so -hmm. i think that's kind of probably what i would say is like they are calling runs they're just throwing they they throw them more in the first half for whatever reason and um and again like i don't know what the change was but they were much more effective running the football and i felt like they were just like go get it go go hit these runs and again the old line gets a feel they get a better understanding for the angles and, and the timing on double teams and how those linebackers are playing it, so that could be part of it. But I also just think it's like, hey, man, let's go run the football. So um, I don't know if it's if it's if it's entirely on EB in terms of play calling, in terms of flow. I think a yep. little bit of it's like they're a little bit more happy with the RPO, a little more trigger happy to throw those in the first half. Um, and also, I do think like the game flow the past couple of weeks, they've had a little bit of a lead. They're kind of managing the game a little bit more, and um, I think there's there's value to running the football. And I, you know. Hopefully you can kind of figure that out and sprinkle that in a little bit more in the second half. But I don't think the disparity between the first and second half is as dramatic when you sit down and like look at all the RPOs that they were running. Got it. Uh, all right. What else from the offense? Uh, obviously, Terry more involved this week, and it felt purposeful yeah. um, early in the game. Love that. Then he winds up getting the big touchdown uh, as he, as he uh, put out on social media to, uh, last night. It's like, make the most of your opportunities. Boy, did he. Yeah. Um, you know, Jahan didn't quite have the noisiest game uh, like we thought he might, uh, but yeah. that's in part because Sertan didn't follow McLaren as perhaps as much as we thought. Yeah. Um, and by the way, Terry's getting that PI on Sertan. Uh, it's like, no, nah, man, yeah. I'm that dude. I'm, yeah. I'm Terry McLaurin, and I am hard to cover. Sure. Um, Curtis gets his touches. Uh, obviously, tremendous catch by Logan. 
Uh, the great catch by Bates up the sideline. Um, Cole Turner has the screen. Like Gibson has the massive screen. By the way, uh, obviously, if you if you missed it, take five yesterday went deeper into the screens. Uh, but Gibson has a screen. And then there's B-Rob, who just had a fantastic day all around. A couple of big catches, including a big screen late in the game, uh, almost 100 yards rushing. Like, Think of all the playmakers I just named. Everybody got yeah. their touches. Um, and that's that's a fantastic job by EB, by Sam, and, and by all those dudes to take advantage of them. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think the thing I just, you know, high level that I'd like to point out is the running rushing attack in the second half and the utilization of the running backs. I think that's kind of what you're hoping for from a from a utilization standpoint. And I think when you have a guy like, you know, I said I said this on a show, um, you know, that I think B Rob could lead the team in all pur purpose yards. I think he could be one of the most valuable pieces on offense, maybe the best player on the offense at when the year is done. And it's because of games like this, he's going to get a lot of touches. And he's a good football player. He's physical. He catches the football well. And um, and I think this this is a this feels like a winning formula. It's not thirty carries for B Rob. It's you know what was it? what did he end up with? It was like I don't it was know, nineteen for eighty nine. Nineteen. I think that's a really good number for this offense because I think you want to make sure the receivers are getting the football. But I think 18, if he can, eighteen for eighty seven. Want to be in yeah, the but final. if he can be efficient and then he catches the football a couple times, he had two really nice screens. One in the first half, obviously the one in the second half, but. I look at that and I say to myself, like, man, like that, that is the formula. Then get Gibson a couple touches in space. He's able to maximize those. And I think this running back room could be extremely dangerous. And I think something you could probably lean more on moving forward, especially if Sam's having a hard time getting the ball out of his hands quickly. Like, let's get some concepts where those backs are, you know, a little flare to the flat, ball out, little screen, ball out, you know, like that kind of stuff, especially when they are rewarding your play call with production. So that's something I would say, like, just keep an eye on that and something that I think could easily switch in terms of helping Sam manage some of those pressure situations a little bit better. Yeah. All right. Anything else on the offense that we want to hit before we switch over to the monster day that the defensive, uh, the defense had for, I would say, the middle part of the game, the monsterly yeah. bad first quarter and a half, but uh, before we switch over to defense. Um, I don't know. I can't think of anything else. We talked about pretty much everything. Talked about the line. We talked about the skill position guys. We talked about the quarterback. So yeah, I think so that's we can, uh we can move on. Yeah, that's it. Uh if you like us so far, subscribe. Uh and and if not, keep listening for the defense and maybe it'll improve just like the game did. <laughs>Take Command podcast from Odyssey Sports. Logan Paulson there. I am Craig Hoffman. Uh, again, if you have not subscribed to the pod, love you to do so just for your sake. You know, we don't want you to miss an episode. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, the free Odyssey app or full episodes on YouTube. If you want to watch us, youtube.com slash at 1067 the fan and don't miss us pregame Sundays on the radio on team 980. Uh, of course on uh, 1067 the fan on both YouTube channels live at tap sports bar MGM national Harbor. And then the post game show roughly 90 minutes after the game on it being a little closer to two hours this week, but again, subscribe on YouTube. That's a YouTube only stream. And then the pod comes out first thing Monday morning. So youtube.com slash at the team 980 and at 1067 the fan. Okay. Let's get into the defense slogan. Um, Let's let's start at the beginning. Let's get it out of the way. Flush it from sure. our systems. Then never talk about it again. What the hell happened the first quarter and a half defensively where Denver gets out three touchdowns, three drives in thoroughly dominant fashion? Yeah, so I, I think they came out with a really good game plan. One of the first things that stuck out to me is they really came out and said, we're going to run a lot of... Um, uh, a lot of pin pull stuff, you know what I mean? Like a lot of uh, this kind of like what I would call truck or taxi, which is like where you are blocking down with the receiver, you're pulling the offensive lineman, you're leading with the fullback. And, you know, we've talked about that concept before, versions of that concept. I think when we were going to play Arizona, that was something that came up quite a bit. But they, this team has a hard time fitting those runs for whatever reason. I'm not exactly sure why that is. Um, you know, like the, the technique that they're telling the defensive ends to employ is to like run basically straight up the field, get that guy to bubble, get the running back to bubble, and then hopefully pursuit hits it. But, uh, you know, they ran that play twice. The first big run was that play. And again, like that's something that needs to be better. Jamin is uh, on the first one, runs outside. He's, you know, he's playing that like overhang, will backer, fits the tackle. You get two guys outside, you get Forbes outside, you get Jamin outside, and then Cody, who's playing in the backside B-gap, 
you know, I, there's no feasible way you can expect him to get over there, like just based on the structure of the front. Um, he gets walled out of a gap. He gets walled. He, he gets blocked. But I'm also like someone is messed up on the front side of this run. I don't know if Jamin's supposed to wrong arm that guard, basically hit his inside shoulder to try and get the back to bubble to the corner. Um, but they misfit that. And uh, and again, that ends up being a big play. And that, that's one play they've had a consistently hard time fitting. And they run that again for the touchdown on that same drive. Like that's kind of what they want to do, right? Is they ran that. The crazy thing to me is that Sean Payton did not run that play after they scored a touchdown with it. So like they had two huge gasses and then they were like, no, we're good. We're not going to run that play anymore. So that that's a good example to me of an offensive coordinator kind of outthinking himself or forgetting what's been working for him. Um, I did think there was a, a big effort early in the game to get Jamin on the field more. You know, they were in true nickel as opposed to their Cinco nickel, um, which is a kind of a departure from what they would normally do. Um, then as the game went on, they kind of got back into that Cinco nickel, which is, you know, the five defensive linemen, um, Cody five and then backs, yeah. Cam and then Cody and Cam in the box. Right. So they kind of got back into that as the game went on. And I, I felt like they were better out of that from a pressure standpoint, but also like, Sean Payton wasn't calling the stuff that was working for him on the first couple drives, you know, like they had kind of gotten away from that a little bit. So that was a little bit surprising. Um, the next touchdown, the long uh, touchdown to Mims, they're trying to get into like one of these cover two inverts that they run where they bring the corners, they drop the defensive tackles out. They have the safeties play halves and then Cody Barton plays the middle of the field. I don't know exactly the rules on that coverage, but by rule of Tampa two, general Tampa two, Cody's got to carry that vertical and Marvin Mims versus Cody Barton is a mismatch like nine out of 10 times. So yeah, that, that play, I watched it back. It was funny because Anthony uh, yesterday comes into the bullpen as we're preparing for the show. And he's like, what happened on that play? I was like, let's pull it up. And nobody plays it well because there's just like, eventually you, like, you got to be football players kind of deal. And, you know, I think you can make an argument that like, because it, it, Mims comes across the field, crosses the center line. And so, like, okay, he's in Derek Forrest's deep half, right? Percy Butler, hey, man, everything's happening in front of you. There's no one else close to you. Yeah. You should carry that. Cody Barton, carrying the vertical is actually your yeah. responsibility. But, like, from a, a logic standpoint, like you just said, from a speed, like, actual matchup standpoint, you have no shot. So it's hard to really get that mad at you. Um, and it, it, there's just kind of a lot of dudes, like, covering no one. And that's not ideal. And that's that's the hard part about zone coverage and these match rules and how they play it. And from an analysis standpoint, nevertheless, an execution guys on the field standpoint yeah. is like you have things that pull you in opposite directions. Like, I don't want to vacate this area because what if someone comes into it? But also, I don't know, that guy seems to be running wide open for a touchdown. Do I go chase him? And and that's why it's hard. And, you know, they ran a cover two beater and they beat cover two. Sometimes the offense wins. Yeah. And again, like you'd like maybe them to say, oh, you know, the two tight ends are locked up, you know, and Percy should match that. But again, if they run a crosser the other way into the zone, which people do, they run a post by number yep. by the one to his side and they run a crosser. If he matches the post, like crosser is wide open, it's a touchdown to the crosser. So um, really, to me, that just feels like a, a, a good call versus a, a coverage that um, you're just, you're trying to kind of get them. You're trying to trick them. You're trying to trick them into kind of like, you know, you're bringing these corners. You're trying to get the tackles to block down on the ends. You're dropping the defensive tackles out. You're trying to match crossers and kind of, you know, and and they just had a good call. Like they, they really just had an excellent call versus the structure that the defense presented. It leads to a touchdown. So that's 14 points right there. Excellent starting drive. They had a run that was really giving them fits in terms of how they how they needed to fit it. And then they had a, a great, a, a really good call versus a coverage that's not that it's not great against. So I, I mean that's that's really what it boils down to. And I think one of the one of the reasons they're able to settle in in the second half is a I think Sean Payton gets away from the stuff that he's that that those runs that we were just describing, like which is totally baffling to me. But whatever, they get back into that Cinco front. You get guys some one on one matchups, and that ends up playing out great for them. Not that Jamin or Cody were playing poorly. It's just that, like, you know, you got your good players on the field, man. You get them in one on ones, and, and those guys are going to heat and hunt for you. And then um, I think uh, they did a better job in coverage in the back end of kind of playing, I don't want to say more vanilla stuff, but stuff that they were more comfortable with. So there weren't as many free runners in the back end. Obviously, there's the touchdown with the crossers, which is a tough, tough look again. They're yeah, basically, basically running brutal. like 
basically running mesh out of a three by two out of empty. So the two crossers go. I think Jamin and Cody do a pretty good job, or Cam do a pretty good job of passing it off. But Benjamin St. Juice matches. So in mesh, you get the two inside guys cross, right? right? I'm sure people can visualize that. Then you have a third element that's basically running a sit over the ball, but it looks like they're running like a high cross. So St. Juice, who again is out wider because it's an empty formation, matches that crosser and then uh, matches that kind of sit route. And then the crosser comes up and he it's kind of it enters his zone and ends up being a touchdown. So that's that's what I would say there is like they just didn't to me that feels like a mental mistake by St. Juice. Yeah, they they put, you know, St. Juice, Kendall, and Cody all in conflict and they did not resolve said conflict. I mean, it's t- that's why mesh is a good that's why mesh is good, man. Yeah. Mesh is good versus match, mesh is mesh is good versus zone because it forces guys to like play you know, communicate at a high level and and kind of remember their rules very, very quickly. And um, they kind of came out and ran it out of a different formation and it and they didn't see it quick enough and it ended up being a touchdown. So yeah, them's the breaks. You get got sometimes. Yeah, the offense. I mean, it's funny because we we talk about the good stuff that happens on the offensive side and the film breakdown and people are like, yeah, go get them, EB. And then when yeah. it happens to your defense, it's like, how could you possibly ever let that happen? And it's like, because sometimes the offense wins and sometimes <laughs> yeah, the defense wins. Right. And that happens in both sections of the podcast when we do the film breakdown. Yeah. Um, they obviously do get back to that Cinco front uh, a little right. bit later in the game. And you see that in the first possession of the second half, the Duran Payne three and out, which is just one of the most thoroughly dominant sequences of plays I'll, you'll ever see in the NFL from a singular player. Just yeah, a crazy. tremendous individual effort. And like it, there are other guys that matter on that. Like, let's not make it wholly individual because his defensive line mates have to do their job, et cetera. But I wasn't kidding when Michael Phillips and I uh, could have been playing safety on that. That, but the the back end did not matter at all on those. Just such quick, violent wins by Duran, um, and you see that throughout the game. Um, not just from Duran, but John has a couple. Uh, Montez yeah. obviously has a couple. Chase has a couple, um, and and that's what can elevate this defense into the upper echelon, top ten, yeah. certainly top five. Uh, if Chase is going to clean up a few things and stay, you know, keep the the great stuff. It's so funny to me how the discussions around chase and the discussions around Sam wind up sounding the exact same, <laughs> but um, you know, if, if he can now contribute on that higher level, like the sky's the limit for this defense. And and I think you see it, you saw the flashes that you want to see. And then the question is, can they just be a little bit more consistent and can they start faster, obviously, uh, and make their lives a lot easier because against a team like Buffalo, perhaps versus a team like Denver, the comeback might not be there uh, in the way that it was yeah. on, on Sunday. Well, like I said, I've already started a little bit uh, of, of of the Bills prep, and they, that offense does a great job of just creating a ton of ton of grass, you know. And we'll we'll preview them more in the in the preview show, but that that's a scary bunch of playmakers over there. Yeah, but yeah, I, I agree with you. I think um, you know, obviously, the thing with uh, Duran, like they're they're trying to take a play action shot on the first play of that sequence, right of the, of the first half. They're trying to put. Okay, the so deck. maybe Michael and I would not have been ideal at safety then. But but I think to your point though, like they're in a slide protection. The two tight ends are blocking. Montez, like they're doubling him. You got McGlinchey, who's has to block down on the three, and he basically is like, "I've never seen a three technique before in my life. I'm going to take like terrible footwork." And Duran's like, "Sweet, knock your inside <laughs> hand down and get a sack." Like, talk about a quick win! Like, holy cow, man! And so again, that's what that structure, that front structure, gives you is it. It makes it a little bit. The footwork changes a little bit for the offensive line. The protection rules change a little bit, and you get stuff like that. The next play, they're trying to run the football. And Duran goes a little bit rogue, but basically says, I'm going to beat this guy inside. Beats him inside. There's a huge crease, but I love, I, I think it'd be interesting to talk to him about it because the back's an offset gun away. So Duran's on the defensive left and the back is offset to the defensive right. And so when that happens, you got to know as a blocker and as a, as a defender, it takes the back longer to get to the play side of the run, which is one of the reasons I freaking... <clears throat> hate offset gun runs because it basically plays like tight zone. And so Duran, I, I would bet the second he gets that hat to him, he says, I can win this inside because the back is so far away. Beats the guard inside, plays vertical, makes the tackle for loss. Love that. Love, I, I love that little detail. And I, it, again, it'd be interesting to ask him if he recognized that or if he just was like, I felt the guard overreach and I went for it. The next play, Montez Sweat with an excellent ET. He absolutely smokes the guard. He's got a free run of the quarterback. Russell Wilson vacates to the right. Duran does a great job of keeping contain on that play and bats the football down. So it wasn't entirely Duran, but like 
pretty damn close, man. You know what I mean? Pretty damn yeah. close. And again, great job by Montez there. But like that that sequence to me, and couple that with the sequence that they had last week against Arizona, where it's like I think it was Duran Tekka for loss, uh, Allen Tekka for loss, Montez sack. Like that those those sequences didn't happen last year. Or at least I don't remember them happening. Where they were like, hold up, time out. Like we're done with whatever's happening right now. We're just going to assert ourselves on this game. And that to me is the characteristic, and I've said this a million times, that's the characteristic of a dominant group. So for them to come out, play the way they did, for Chase to play the way he did coming back on 40 snaps was awesome. Um, again, Montez, great day. Like there are times where that pocket just, it doesn't even look like it's there. It's just a sieve of bodies running to him and guys just winning one-on-one. And I think in, uh, you know, um, in Allen's post-game presser, he's like, it's a race, man. I, I, it's like, I'm trying to beat them because there's only a finite number of sacks you can get in a game and we're all racing to get there and that's a very scary notion especially when guys are being productive with their rushes and getting where they got to get um what about chase specifically um certainly an up and down day uh there are some rushes where he gets way too high yeah. there's sometimes he gets kind of buried inside and there's there's alleys to the outside but i think what's cool is you see as the game goes i, I feel like it happened a little bit less and or like you know he does it on one snap and the very next snap he is super tight and he, he's super on the screws. Um, I also think as the game goes, you see him and Allen playing with each Touching other better, a little bit yeah. more, um, the way that that they're able to do some stunts and twist some games up front, um, or just John realizes that like I got to pay a little bit more attention to what Chase is doing and then cover for him if he's mm -hmm. going to do stuff. Um, and I don't know what which one of those it is, uh, but I, I feel like he got better as the game went. Sure. And you see the high upside stuff that makes him super special. And if they can keep tightening the screws, then it's just going to get better and better as the year goes. And and then, you know, who knows? Yeah, I mean, there was a couple rushes where I was like, man, that's that could be better. And there was one. So, for example, on the fumble, on Jamin's fumble, like he, he goes violently inside, violent inside rush. And I was like, I wonder, like that's that's poor rushing integrity, right? Because, um, you know, obviously Russell Wilson's going to escape and, and scramble for a first down. But I do remember in the game plan show that I do with Coach Ron Rivera, he said, I said, how do you kind of manage like a rusher's creativity? Because, you know, they're basically artists. You know what I mean? They, like they're going to like the creative, the creative rushers are the best rushers. The ones that rush outside of structure are the best because they can kind of do whatever and it puts the offensive line in a bind. And he said, well, I think one of the things Jack has done a good job of is, is identifying packages where they can be Rembrandt. Where they can go do what they want to do. And did Ron so, really say Rembrandt? No, I said Rembrandt. I'm putting, I'm, oh, okay. flat, I'm churching up a little bit <clears throat> okay. for Ron, for Ron's sake. Anyway, um, but in that look, Jamin is spying Russell. And so mm. if you're going to be Rembrandt in a situation, it's that situation. And then, so great inside move, vacates the pocket, and Jamin is really fast. Like he is very, very fast. Like holy cow, watching him to run that down was yes. so impressive. And so, so this is a point I made yesterday, but I want to make it here too. Yeah. This is the difference between a first round pick and like a third round, fourth round yeah. guy at linebacker is let's just make it David Mayo. David yeah. Mayo could also spy Russell Wilson, yes. but he probably runs him out of bounds and it's probably a two, three yard gain. Jamin Maybe, yeah. is so fast that he gets there before the sideline and is able to force a fumble. And, and that one to two yard difference Right, it's a sack, it's behind the line of scrimmage, but that one and two yard difference of escorting him out of bounds and having to live to fight another down versus the game-changing turnover is what makes a guy like Jamin Davis worth a first-round pick. Yeah. Now, he's got to be more consistent over time, and you know I'd like to see him play more and all those types of things. But like when you talk about the special stuff of a Montez, of a Chase, of a Jamin Davis, like that's, that's the level of detail that we're talking about one to two yards here and there, which is the difference between a turnover and a three-yard gain out of bounds that is just a mundane play in the NFL. Yeah, and so, I mean, if you have, if, if, if anybody has time, go watch it. Watch from the end zone because he is like, he, it looks like everyone's kind of in slow motion and he's like sped up for some reason. And he, the way he closes that distance is is pretty spectacular. So that's one where I think maybe Chase has, has got a little bit more uh, free reign to kind of be creative with his rush. There's another one where he gets high. And you're like, man, that's way too high in the rush. Russell steps up, finds a lane, runs for a first down. I think they get a holding call, so it's negated. Not on Chase, but you're like, come on, Chase, be more disciplined. But to his credit, man, the very next play, he's got a suit, very next rush. 
very tight rush angle. He's almost shoulder to shoulder with John. John does a great job of collapsing the pocket. There's nowhere for Russell to go. And then Chase escapes late and then runs him down and gets his first sack of the game, you know? And I'm like, that that maturity by him is something that we didn't see a lot when he was healthy last year or two years ago. And to see that kind of starting to come on his own, like that was a self-correction because he didn't have time to go to the sideline and get yelled at by Ron or Coach Scanina. Like he had to say, man, I was too high. Let me fix that up. There was another one where I thought, you know, it looks like he's he's coming uh, he's coming in underneath, and then Montez is up getting the sack coming over the top. But that is a rush plan versus scrambling quarterbacks, and I wonder if that was an opportunity for him to work an inside move. Uh, Montez takes it really high, understanding where he's going to vacate, knowing he's getting inside pressure, and Montez gets the sack. So I do think there was some times where he was rushing. Maybe you'd have to ask him about it, but just to my eye rushing really well in the context of the rush and making corrections mm-hmm. in game that I thought were very mature. So from a pass rush standpoint, I was very, very pleased with what he was doing. I thought he showed good power, thought he showed a good understanding of the line, was very deliberate with that, and had 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 dominant elements to his game, which is something that we've all been kind of waiting for from a pass rush, rush standpoint. He's always been pretty good against the run, but to see him kind of be that guy like, like Max Crosby. I've been watching a lot of Max Crosby because – Las Vegas last week, they played the Bills, so watching him. He is so consistent about rushing his line, rushing his pass rush line, the line between him and the quarterback, and not deviating from it. Mm-hmm. Like, the tackle has to be perfect for 60 snaps if he's pass blocking him, right? And I saw a little bit of that from Chase, which gets me really excited that as he starts to go and continue to improve, that rush line is going to be super dialed in, and he's going to be much more productive this year. So, again, um, first game back. Some things that were not good, some things that could have been better. But I think on the whole, after watching the film, I was um, more pleased than displeased and more excited about the future uh, with him. All right. Last thing, back end wise, um, oh, yeah. we, you, you had some fun uh, at my expense because on the pregame show, my key to the game was no explosives. And you're like, cool, good analysis, bro. How do you do it? Um, that, that was kind of your comment on the post game, which I was like, you know, that's a fair point. The answer is. Don't bust coverage. How do you call <laughs> stuff that your guys can execute and That's you do not point. lose guys? Um, and so I think a comment you made about 10 minutes ago at this point, uh, they switched to a little bit more vanilla coverage on the back yeah. end, uh, obviously plays into that. How do you prevent coverage bust? How do you prevent explosives? You make sure you keep everything in front of you, even if you give some stuff up and you're not confusing quarterbacks. And I think the the benefit at this point with the personnel that you have is you can do that stuff and still create turnovers because yeah. Emmanuel Forbes is a turnover machine. Yeah. And you've got speed all over the field. And that's fantastic because the simpler it is for you, the better, the less chance that someone's going to make some kind of critical mistake. So when we talk about you know, the things to clean up and starting faster, how much do you think that plays into it moving forward of maybe Jack dials it back a little bit earlier in games to make sure that his group gets into a nice rhythm and that there are no big explosive plays available because of, you know, self mistakes. Yeah. No, let's be clear. I don't want to make it sound like Jack was going crazy out there. He just had a couple calls early that, you know, are a little bit of a novelty item and they've run them a lot in training camp or whatever, but they're a little bit new and they just didn't execute. It was a good call by, by Sean Payton. Um, you know, the other thing to, to the kind of this point that you're talking about is like they got a little bit simpler and simple is a relative term here. Like the defense that they're running are insanely complicated because they're running all these matches. They got to match three by ones. The yeah, rules there's change. a ton of rules. It's and stuff. crazy. So it's 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 very complicated. But I did I did feel like they, they did a good job of kind of bouncing between match and softer coverages. Um, and the other thing is like they were more consistent in the second half. And the Broncos weren't like, and I think that is also kind of to your point, like you made me think about it with the Forbes thing is Forbes gets an interception because Cortland Sutton is running a route that like doesn't appear to be in the playbook. You know, he's running a, he's running like a hitch, but he's running it at like 15 yards. And I don't, I've never been exposed to a hitch at that depth. And so Russell Wilson is expecting him to be there. He's not there. Kudos to Forbes though, like playing with excellent technique, right? Cause he's playing like this kind of catch to, soft quarters look where he's kind of his hips are open to the quarterback and he's kind of backpedaling and you know if he's matching the receiver there's no way he makes the play but if he's playing the technique correctly makes an excellent play on the football so i do think that again that's a, like a base day one coverage for them i do think the more of that stuff you see the better it gets you know even on chase's sack Cortland sutton basically is blocking the corner 
and Russell's trying to throw him the football. So, like, obviously, like, there's an element of, like, hey, man, offensively and defensively, let's keep it simple so our guys do what they're supposed to do and we can play fast. And I felt like in the second half of that game, kind of getting back to that Cinco stuff, again, simpler coverage structures, ends up paying dividends for them down the road. Also, there were some great pressure packages I thought Jack brought that allowed them to kind of, again, not all the time, but sprinkled in a little bit. Like, for example, um, they run like a Cinco where they're dropping guys out, they stunt pain, and then Barton's like looping around as the spy, and they get a great hit on the quarterback. So there was enough variation, I thought, but they got away from like the super intricate stuff. And I do think that moving forward, that is something that is going to be really advantageous for this group because when they're playing fast, like they're an excellent group. Yeah, no, without question. Uh, Because, dude, when this team plays fast, they they are real fast. Real they, fast. I mean, the speed you have – all three levels is is pretty spectacular uh, from Montez and Chase on the edges to Barton and especially Jamin uh, in, in the middle or Cam when he's playing down on that second level. And then, uh, you know, on the back end, guys like Percy Butler, Emmanuel Forbes, incredible speed. Uh, so they they cover a lot of grass and that shows up week to week on the tape. All right. Uh, anything else from the game? Uh, if not, we can we can get up mm-hmm. on out of here. I think that's it. I mean, we kind of covered all the big plays, I think. And, you know, uh, I mean, yeah. there was the one to Forbes, the deep pass. He just gets beat by guys a little bit faster than him. Um, that happens sometimes. But I feel yeah. like he's actually in pretty good technique and pretty good phase overall. But I think I think there's a lot of really good things, both offensively and defensively, to learn from. And also some things that make you get really excited moving forward. Some some bad stuff to improve and some really high-level stuff you say, man, if they can keep do more of that, they're going to be a dangerous group and they're going to, this is something we said, we said, like, I think in our preview of the season is like, if they can play consistent, tough football, they're going to punch up. They're going to win games. They shouldn't win. And I, this, this game felt like that a little bit, handled the adversity, got after it. So I'm excited, man. I hope, and hopefully this crowd is bumping for this bills game. Cause that's going to be a lot yeah, of fun. I cannot wait. I will be at FedEx this weekend. I said that for week one. And then, then I got, got, by the sickness, uh, please, to whatever deities are in control of said things, whatever one you pray to, allow me to be at FedEx Field this weekend. Uh, it's going to be a good time. All right. Uh, when we uh, get back on the preview pod, we will obviously take a look at the Buffalo Bills and how the commanders match up against them. Uh, if you want a deeper dive on the screen game, make sure you check out Take 5 from yesterday. We'll do some Buffalo stories uh, on Take 5 for tomorrow. And then uh, Friday morning, the preview pod comes out. We might have a special guest for that one. Working we'll working see. on that. Working I don't want to I don't want to promise anything, but we're uh, we're working on it. So uh, stay tuned for that. Subscribe, and that way you get everything as soon as it comes out on your favorite podcast, audio or video platform. And uh, we'll see you later in the week on Take Command. Thanks for watching this clip of Take Command. First, why don't you why don't you like it? It lets other people know that it was good, and then they should watch it too. And Logan, we have a new exclusive home for full episodes. We do. 1067 The Fans YouTube page. Go check it out and please subscribe. Yeah, do do what Logan said. Do it. Very, very smart.